<laughs> so please continue and hopefully we'll, we can do that without a glitch today. But I'd like to share the pictures that came in late and some of them, some of the interesting pictures uh, that came up. All right, so I've optimized okay. for sharing. That is not what... Oh, how pretty. How neat. We might want to all mute. We might want to all mute our mics. Yeah. So, Dean, what happened here? Oh, your screen, your screen is sharing. Here are the pictures. And I optimize. This is from, this is from Grace Caputo, Herman, Herman, uh, uh, Shemanke. I'm sorry, Herman. If I... Yep. These are your pictures. Jessica Lair. Uh, Martha Herrera, this is Michael Dobbs's. Uh, his family is his sacred uh, space, uh, beautiful. Sharon Conway. Sharon, are you with us? <laughs> yes, I am. There's Sodi. Any place he is, is a sacred place. Uh, now, this is from uh, Catherine Trawick. Uh, these are places. <laughs> Catherine wrote, there are places to stop and pray with a canticle of creatures as you walk around the labyrinth. This was a, a, a painting that uh, Gemma Fenbert uh, sent in, a picture of uh, sacred space, my painting of it, she said. Uh, as we said, not everybody can get out and walk around. And uh, uh, Jean, Jean Archechi, Ar Archechi, Archechi. Uh, this is a picture of my imaginary walk today. The ocean is also one of my sacred spaces. Seeing the untouched beauty, the involvement of the senses, the smell of the salt air, the taste of the salt water, the sound of the wind and the waves crashing on shore the cold water and sand on my bare feet, the warmth of the sun on my back, and the beautiful panoramic sunrises and sunsets. Praying at home happens in different rooms and different times of the day, sometimes sitting quietly, sometimes walking, and sometimes in the quiet of night. Uh, very beautiful. So this is from Dr. Arvin Johnson uh, at St. Francis uh, College. Um, my sacred space is a special corner within a very special room at the University of St. Francis, I'm sorry, that's the University of St. Francis, not St. Francis County, in uh, Juliet, uh, uh, Illinois. The very spe uh, special space is within our Sala Santa Chiara, uh, the room of St. Clair, which was our sponsoring congregation's community room back when our mother house was filled with members of the congregation. It remains a special sacred space dedicated to our sister sponsors. But within that sacred space is a, is a special corner which features a couch that in turn celebrates our mascot, a St. Bernard with pillows and a throw. That is my sacred space that I look to for protection, comfort, and joy and share with selected others who are seeking the same. Uh, this one came from uh, uh, Sister Colleen Byrne. Uh, the outdoor shot is our monastery backyard where I was walking and doing some garden work. The indoor is a tabernacle, is our little chapel where I pray a lot. And then this picture was sent in from Mary. Those, these two pictures were sent in from Mary Dibbs. This was a picture we took at the, um, when our, our, we went on a uh, pilgrimage uh, last year, was this uh, 2019 or was this 2018, Mary? Mm. This is a picture we took at the War Cemetery in the in the uh, Assisi Common in the in the valley below the city, and this was the a walking a shot of our feet. And can uh, the prize goes to anybody who can tell me who's in the um, in the uh, um, friar outfit there to the left. That's... Love you, Father Conrad. There you go, Sharon, you got it. All right, Boy, now. I'm... with St. Francis. 
<laughs> okay. All right, Dean. I think it's I I well, go, I bring it back to you, and uh, I think it's uh, Sister Edna's the video, right? Sister Edna, right to the video. Uh, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, as the time is at your place. Uh, we are going to enter into day two of our virtual pilgrimage. And to get us started, I'd like to share a song, a video song, that will set the tone. It's very familiar. Uh, please, if you'd like to sing along, I bet you you know the words. <clears throat> but if you do, uh, please do mute yourself first so that um, we don't have the time lag in the video. Okay, we're on. Go ahead, Dean. Ya tienes la misa ya. Ya tienes la misa en tu cuarto. Dean, we don't have the volume. Tengo que sentarte aquí, pero es por plática. Hey, Dean. Oh, it's gone. You muted me.
I'm gonna shut the door, okay? Okay. I'm sorry about that. That was meant to be a song, but we somehow missed the music from it. So, but it, it's okay. That's okay. It's okay. We sang it's a it. super way to share the screen. You have to share the sound and the video rather than just the screen. That's okay, Dean. Don't worry about it. We somehow get to where we're supposed to be and not where we wanted to be. And I think that's the one of those instances. Uh, uh, the, the, you know, as that was going along, I was playing it in my head and uh, the song in my head. And it, w without the music, it makes you pay attention to the pictures a little bit. So maybe, maybe it was all, all for what we were supposed to do is pay, pay attention to those uh, beautiful pictures that went along with it. Okay, thank you very much. We'll turn it over to uh, whenever you're ready. I think Conrad is up. Conrad, you've got the call to pilgrimage. A few notes about the, uh, being a pilgrim. I read earlier this morning that the Sanskrit word for chess player is the same for pilgrim. And I'm not really a chess player, but you do have to take a chance and risk everything. Well, when I was a child, well, let me tell you this, I think I was set up because when I was a child, my father was a steel worker in uh, Southwest of Chicago. My mother was a housewife, but got odd jobs. But my dad was on strike. So we didn't have a lot of money, but my dad believed that travel was good for the mind. And my mother believed it was, travel was good for the soul. And I was reflecting about this, why I'm so gung-ho about pilgrimage, is that I think I learned it from them. Um, every every uh, uh, summer, my father would take us to a place called Holy Hill in Wisconsin. He woke us up at 4 o'clock in the morning. I hated it then, but I'm doing it now. So we'd make it there for the 7 o'clock Mass. That was a pilgrimage. And then when I was in third grade, my, his best friend, who became my godfather, wanted to go, this is 1955, wanted to go to Montreal and to Quebec because they, had thir they heard they were building a brand new shrine to St. Joseph and St. Anne. And my dad had a 1955 Dodge. That's what my godfather asked my dad. And so we had seven people in this jalopy, as my father would call it, we went, we stopped off in different places. I remember London, Ontario. I thought that was the London I was learning about. I had no idea there was another London. And then we got to Quebec. And to this day, I remember when I was going up the steps. I haven't been there since, by the way. I'd like to return. And I was going up the steps, and I saw this sarcophagus of Andre Bessette. And it was the brother that had built this beautiful, beautiful place honor of Joseph, and uh, I remember praying to him about being a priest. Well, be careful what you pray for. But again, I think all those trips and Sundays, uh, people, I like to tell people we did this, but it was traditional. We went to the cemetery. And get this, we would take blankets, and we'd take a lunch. We would sit there and other people, and we would just talk about you know, the, the, the day and all the, uh, uh, the people that were there and tell funny stories. So I think in a way, I'm, think, I'm, I'm just reflecting about this recently and saying, golly, I think that's where it all began. Well, when we talk about call to pilgrimage, I think it has to be preceded by the yearning. Something has to be planted inside of you. Um, what, what do they say? Um, Uncover what you long for, 
and you will discover who you are. And as I grew older, uh, I went to a boarding school in Wisconsin, which I thought people say you're gonna be homesick. Well, I was a little bit, but it was travel. And guess where I went? I went to a boarding school staffed by Franciscans. And from there, I joined the order at a very early age. Well, you're too young. You don't have experience of the world. I says, yeah, but I wanna learn. And of course, our particular college program was not in a monastery. They did something radical. We all went to the University of Wisconsin. We had to wear t-shirts and jeans and we mixed them with everybody else. And again, I was getting this cosmopolitan idea mixed with the Franciscan idea of being with people. But as I grew older, I learned about something when I was in college. And one of our professors, Franciscan professors, talked about the three great pilgrimages that we are all called to embark upon. I said, well, I know the Muslims go to Mecca. I know the Jews go to Jerusalem. But I think we go to Rome. Well, I was one out of three. The second was the Holy Land. But then the third, the third was intriguing. I had never heard of it. It was the Camino de Santiago de Compostela. And I immediately raised my hand and wanted to find out more about it. And uh, the friar, Friar Mark, he talked with passion about how you risk everything and you go discover who you are in relationship to the world. Something I was already doing since my early childhood. And so as I put it on my back burner, I decided I would discover more about it. I read different books about it, and I think there was different, oh, and then St. Francis, I remember in the, I think in the Fioretti, or, the, or, or, Saint, or the, who's the biographer, or Cholano, Francis had a yearning to go to the Camino. When we see the video on Rieti, um, he was so intrigued. If you don't know anything about the Camino Santiago, you can Google it up. Um, the, the legend is they found the body of St. James, the apostle, who had got to Spain to preach the gospel. He died there, and someone found the body in a field, a campo, and was indicated by the star, Stella, Campo Stella. Well, word got around in the medieval internet system, and of course it just spread like wildfire, and people flocked and walked, and it became a source of healing, a source of discovery, and the characteristic of the Camino de Santiago was a scallop shell. The scallop shell was worn around your neck, and it was an indication you were looking for hospitality, and people would leave you alone. As a matter of fact, when I walked in 2010, after I had retired, they give you what they call a credential. And wherever you go, can you see that pretty good? Wherever you go, you have to get stamped. So that when you get to the actual shrine of St. James, you get your graduation certificate, your Compostela. And this took, I, well, when I decided to go, I was 62 years old. Well, okay, I it wasn't right after I heard it in college, but I wanted to try it out and I was gonna go by myself. And I was still not retired yet. And the Marines found out and there was all types of buzzing and says, someone better go with him. He gets lost everywhere, especially in Iraq. They would get nervous. I was always getting lost. So a young Marine came up to me and says, well, I'm getting out of the Marine Corps. I got 10 years in. I'm going to go. I'm going to college up in Minneapolis, St. Paul. And I just haven't had the summer off. And uh, I think I'll go with you. I says, well, I don't know. I like to go on my own. He says, well, I think I better go with you. But it turned out to be, as I say, Rayfield, kind of like guiding Tobiah. So we both went. And we, we walked it in 34 days. How far is it? Uh, those of you who know something about the Camino, it was 800 kilometers. Uh, again, I was 62, he was 32. We had a big clip. And again, 
a, a pilgrim is a wanderer with a purpose. And I was seeking to continue making travel sacred. I was following up on a yearning that I had a destiny, that there was something calling me. How do you know if you should do it? How do I know if it's calling you? If you're thinking about it, it's calling you. The other two pilgrimages, by the way, uh, Rome, I had gone in 1986 on the Assisi pilgrimage and had come to Rome. And again, uh, Father Rock Niemeyer, uh, that sister that Smeet brought up, was the one of the, he wasn't the founder of the Franciscan pilgrimage program, but he was a animator who took over after Damien Isabel, another friar, and gave it more substance and stressing the whole idea of spirituality of place, i.e., something happened there. I heard of an Eastern European reporter talking to an American and saying to the uh, American reporter, I finally had a chance to visit your country. I went to a, a country called California and the American said, well, what did you like? She said, well, I ignored your Disneyland. I ignored your Universal Studios. I went to see where the free speech speaker, Michael Savio, stood on the steps and where people tried to stop a war. Yearning is that sense in your being that you're trying something to surface. You've got something. And how do you act it out through the senses? I, again, became very conscious of my smelling, of my seeing, my touching. I remember when I was in Camp Pendleton and I was in the Naval Hospital and I was late for a formation. That means in Navy talk or military talk, you're supposed to be someplace and you're not. <laughs> if you're not there, you're, they don't call it AWOL anymore, they call it UA, unauthorized absence. So I was not really late. 15 minutes early, you're late. But I was rushing across these trees. They were like, I, what do they call those pines in Southern California? I don't know what, but they, they were, there was a row of them. I'm running through my uniform and as I get through the trees, I'll never forget this, I heard a sound. Must have been the wind. And I thought to myself, I still remember, I think I'm supposed to stop and listen to this. It was a millisecond. But it changed my perspective, maybe my life. As one of my friars once said, you know that sometimes overheard words can sometimes change lives overheard sounds can captivate us. And as St. Catherine of Siena would say, the more I seek, the more I find. But the more I find, the more I seek. Pilgrimage is addictive, and you want more and more. And I think, uh, gee whiz, I, I, I apply that to all my duty stations I had some pretty wild duty stations. I would always ask to go where nobody else wanted to go. And my, my favorite, the, the reason the Navy in the audience may kind of squint at this, was a desert place called 29 Palms, which the Marine officially called 29 Stumps. That's all that's there. It's in the Mojave, where the Mojave and the Colorado desert meet. Now I'm from Chicago and I'm not used to the desert, but it's fascinating. Because the desert is the place where people would go for purification. And the mountains where the people would go to connect with God. So other duty stations were Okinawa. Five years in Okinawa as a chaplain, as a chaplain, I would tell them I was also teaching chaplains for about three years in Rhode Island. My whole idea for the chaplains was to connect the sailor and the marine to the culture. And Okinawa was magnificent in reverence. And these shrines they had there 
we're worthy of this whole idea of yearning and longing. Hawaii, again, the culture, the indigenous culture of Hawaiians, for those of you who know, was something I wanted to connect with. And again, who is that poet, Ulysses? I become part of all whom I have met. And so as I continued with my quest after the Camino, and it was on the Camino that I was, when my, when my, when my uh, uh, major superior came to my retirement in 2010, um, I had a red 29 palms, my favorite desert place. And uh, he thought it was God forsaken the area, but they came in his habit. I was very happy. The Marines said that, sir, someone's looking for you. I said, are you sure he's looking for me? Oh, yes, sir. He's in his dress browns. <laughs> so I thought, oh, that's, that's probably Father John in his habit. But he asked me, he said, what do you want to do now that you've completed your 22 years? I've been, even in places like Iraq, which has shaken me up, and I'll, we'll talk about that later. But I said, I need to get my mind straight. I need to process something. And that's when I went on the Camino. But actually what I asked him to do, he said, well, you wanna to go to a parish? Do you wanna to go to a high school or whatever? I said, I'd rather go to Walmart and be a greeter. He looked kind of dumbfounded. I said, I just wanna look people in the eyes and tell them that there is a world meant for peace and solidarity out there. He says, okay, um, we'll talk about that later. But here's a letter. I said, who's it from? He said, I'm a president of a university in La Crosse. And I went, wait a minute, I'm in the desert. I'm getting to like it here. Is that near Minneapolis? He says, kinda. Does that mean snow? He says, yep. I said, well, let me go on a Camino to think about this. But as I just to conclude what I'm trying to say is that I, I think there's no such thing there's no such thing as coincidence. I tell people that all the time, it's all providence. Because my first duty assignment, when I joined the reserves of the Navy, they sent me to the 224 Marines in Chicago. I was only in reserves about six months because something happened to me. Well, the CO, commanding officer said to me, we're gonna go on a field trip, chaplain. You'll be a first one. I said, where are we going? He said, we're going to northern Wisconsin to a place called Fort McCoy. I went, okay. We traveled four or five hours. We got there. You know what? I just fell in love with the field, with, with nature, with something about the world. Long story short is that when I did agree to come to the turbo, and I think I agreed because the companions I met on the Camino from all over the world, I asked them, what do you think? And they said, you need to tell your story. And college students would be the best ones. I got to La Crosse, and then I said to somebody, I'm already homesick for my military ambiance. Is there a military base around here? Oh yes, Father, Fort McCoy, 25 miles away. I said, you know what? There's no such thing as coincidence. It all goes around. And as one Dominican sister back in Cincinnati, when I went to school in theology in Dubuque, my Dominican professors, she once told me she was a student. I'm sorry. She, I, I keep calling her a student. She wasn't. She composed with Igor Stravinsky. When I, when I said you were a student, she said, no, Father. I wasn't his student, I composed with Igor. And I said, sister, it's been grand. You've been all around the world. You've been traveling and you've seen all these different places. And then she only said to me, yes, but the best is yet to come. So that's my little spiel. And I think it's just something that uh, I've talked to Greg and um, I think Dean knows about it. So, and that some of the veterans that are here know that story, but I think longing call and it's early the sun is up it's time to set out thanks conrad uh let me just say i i, I consider one of uh life's uh 
greatest gifts that I get to journey with you on the uh, uh, military pilgrimages. And by the way, as you say, you're the call uh, the call for the Camino begins when you first hear of it. And the first time I heard of it is when you came back and told me about it. And uh, uh, eight years later, I was walking it. So mm -hmm. thanks, Conrad. Edna? Well, Conrad talked about um, the call to pilgrimage. And after we've heard that call, the next step is the decision. The decision to go on a pilgrimage is a big one. Because being a pilgrim, as you have heard, is different from being a tourist. A tourist is curious about visiting new geographical places, new maybe new customs, new food, new language, new people, new cultures. Being a tourist immerses you into a new external environment. But being a pilgrim will also take you to new geographical places where you experience new customs and food and languages and cultures. And maybe, just maybe, that's why you signed up for this one. You, you, you heard the word or saw the word Assisi, virtual Assisi, and maybe missed the word pilgrimage because you want to see what the place looks like. You want to get a feel of it. However, the main purpose of a pilgrimage is to take you into your own soul. It's the inner journey, the inner walking. A pilgrim starts out pretty sure of the geographical destination, but the inner spiritual destination is pretty unknown, a big unknown. Here she just knows that it's time to do the hard work, the inner work of self-knowledge, of facing one's illusions, of dealing maturely with losses, failures, and disappointments, of dealing directly, honestly, and courageously with the inescapable events of our lives. Mm. Maybe you've seen that film, The Way. We use it at some of the veterans' retreats. We use parts of it. If you uh, have not, I would encourage you to see that because that's about a man who walks the Camino and you see his own uh, transformation taking place. So as I said, it's a big decision to go on a pilgrimage and not just on a tourist expedition. You know, here at St. Francis Spirituality Center in Tiffin, Ohio, we periodically offer a three and a half day program for first responders who've experienced trauma in the line of duty. It's called Operation Resilience. It has a holistic educational component and it has a process component during which the first responders can talk through some of their pretty tough experiences. They each come with a presenting event that they want to work through. But my experience has been that usually, often by the end of the second day, many of them discover that it's really an unresolved experience from their personal lives that's really weighed them down, and they find great relief, great surprise in discovering, oh my gosh, there it is. It's the whole atmosphere of sharing and talking. It's the quiet sometimes. It's the being together. It's taking walks that finally allows some of those experiences to surface. Well, we call it uh, a program. We hesitate very much to call it a retreat or far even more beyond that, a pilgrimage when we advertise it because calling it a retreat or a pilgrimage scares many first responders, especially those who haven't darkened the inside of a church or a religious service in years. But truly, it is really a pilgrimage. One police officer who graduated from the program um, retreat, by the end of the three days, we can call it a retreat, and then they're fine with it. He told me later, I was more nervous walking into this building on Monday morning than if I had been called to a house where there was an active shooter inside. Doesn't say much about us, I guess, um, but it's because he had been trained to deal with shooters. He had not been trained for this new territory in his own soul. And because of the 
scariness of it, to be quite honest with you, that's why we've had to cancel just as many programs as we've been able to put on because we can't get enough people who are ready to make this kind of pilgrimage. First responders intuitively know that they're going to have to deal with their stuff and that will take courage. But you know, I have also learned this, that all the work that goes into offering a program like this pays off as we see the transformative work going on and the transformation taking place. Um, one police officer wrote in his evaluation, and he was being quite honest, this retreat saved my life, literally. A firefighter who was finally able to face a painful personal issue that she had been trying to medicate away, and this was her last ditch effort before she asked her psychiatrist for an up in the medicine, she wrote, it feels like a ton has been lifted from my shoulders. The peer support, and that's another important part of a pilgrimage. Even as we make this pilgrimage, we aren't really alone, although we may go on our walks by ourselves. So I invite you as we make this pilgrimage to keep remembering that there are uh, right now 71 other participants with us making this pilgrimage. So I conclude by saying, making the decision to go on a pilgrimage, or in some of our cases here, to transform this, hmm, I wanna check that website out. I wanna do that. I wanna see what a CC is like, okay? The transformation from being a tourist to a pilgrim may change your thinking and it may even change your life. But what I say, is the hard work worth it? Oh my goodness, absolutely. From having been to a CC myself, I can say that, absolutely. And I hope as we go through um, this day, you'll see and discover how the tough stuff we deal with is accompanied also by the beauty that's going to be revealed as the course of this day goes on. And especially if you're living, oh gosh, anywhere in Northwest Ohio or around this area, um, Wisconsin as well, wherever we have got this gorgeous, gorgeous weather, beauty and difficulty go hand in hand. As a matter of fact, I think they're two sides of the same coin, the same reality. Thank you. Thanks, Edna. Beautiful. Uh, Father John Quigley, talking about the boon of uh, pilgrimage. Thanks. Um, the boon, what is, what are the benefits? Well, we've been hearing um, already from Edna and uh, Conrad, the, uh, some of the benefits, some of the, uh, the surprising uh, developments and how we can, um, we can't determine them. You can't say, oh, I'm gonna go and by the end of the a plan and a, after a certain period of time when I go to this building or go here, I will experience uh, this transformation. I'll have this particular boon, this benefit. Uh, and some people have noted, when others on uh, pilgrimage, they, they still think of it as a, as a like a, a prayerful time in between other segments, um, especially when they're coming over to Europe, if they haven't had a chance to go up to Germany because their family was from Germany, they they this is their quiet time while they before they go up and see relatives. So it's a, it's kind of an, an European excursion. I'm thinking of. Um, two people who have had very powerful, um, very powerful pilgrimages, Jesus of Nazareth and uh, Francis of Assisi. Um, Jesus uh, had a very eye-opening, powerful experience one day when he left his shop and traveled across over to Galilee and went to the river and he because he had heard this 
of this preacher. And something incredibly wonderful happened to him when he was in the river. It, it, it blessed him, but it also deeply troubled him and confused him so that he, he's thrown into a desert to trying to sort his life out. And then he comes back home after a period of what a month, we say 40 days. And he comes back to his home, Nazareth, and uh, he has this new spirit, this new enthusiasm, and he starts to speak about it when he's in the synagogue. And initially people are just confused, but after a few times, we don't know how many, how many times he tried to interpret or to preach from the scripture, but eventually there was resistance and there was a real strong hostility and he is kicked out of town. And he spends the next three, four years on pilgrimage. He was wandering. He, he didn't have anything. Anything that was secure for him in the past was gone. His, his family was over his back behind his shoulder. And he wandered and he goes back to the river and he connects with John the Baptist. And he needed a place to stay. And Peter, Simon, uh, and Andrew, they bring him into their little community of people. Jesus, as we know now, as the, the, the Christ, as the manifestation of God among us, etc., 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 after 2,000 years of theological reflection, Jesus was forced by grace and by circumstances and by other people's resistance. He was forced to step out into the unknown. And what we see is that he is first attached to the Baptist, but then the Baptist is murdered. And it forces Jesus to make a profound decision. Should he step back from his pilgrimage or should he go back to the security of the carpenter shop? He continues to walk in the footsteps of John the Baptist, continues to live with Peter and that extended family and he realized that he had really very little security and he was forced to look into the eyes of people much more intensely. He was really pushed into gratitude and grateful that Simon's mother-in-law would prepare dinner for them after they were out fishing on an afternoon. Grateful that he had a place to stay. And he started probably because we hear it in his words when he talks about the birds of the air and the, the seed that falls in the ground and the mustard seed and the things that we've been talking about on the retreat so far, you know, how our senses become more refined and intensified. We feel a deeper sense of appreciation for the simplicity of life and gratitude. But it wasn't because he went down to the temple in Jerusalem one high holy day, met with a committee and they came up with a plan that it'd be really good if he would make a directed retreat or something and in that he could, here are the talking points for his ministry. No, he, he did not discover uh, the plan for his life in that academic high energy way. It broke open because he was blessed, but confused. 
a homeless, a refugee. Dependent on the kindness of others for shelter and for food. And it's within that pilgrimage that Jesus the pilgrim comes to understand the ways of his father more deeply and sees how his father also in a way is a pilgrim. Is simple and good and poor and generous, a peacemaker who mourns with those who mourn, who hungers and thirsts for justice. This is who his, our father is. So he encounters his God, our father, in his pilgrimage. And the similar story is with Francis, that Francis was on top of the world full of self-confidence, bravado, musical talent, and creativity, waiting to take over his father's business. And the whole thing comes crashing down around him when he is in prison in Perugia. And in his destruction of his plans, in the destruction of his plans, he is forced into a pilgrimage that brings him perfect joy, that gives him a new bond of fraternity with the lepers and eventually other brothers and sisters with Claire and the holy women. And we also know, because he's so famous for this, that he becomes exquisitely attuned to the little cicada, to the leaves, to Brother Fire, who warms us at night and prepares, helps to prepare our food, to beautiful, chaste, and lively Sister Water, who washes our bodies and our clothes and who nourishes us, keeps us alive. I've found uh, on pilgrimage with people that there are some people who are quite prepared. They've got it, they've got their notebooks ready and they, they you know, they have their cameras. Every, we have one guy who, who lost three cameras. Two were stolen, another he misplaced because he was so completely intent on capturing everything. And gonna go home and present, I don't know, a, a travel hammer or something. But I saw him about two months ago and we were talking and he said one of the greatest gifts was losing his cameras, losing his control over the experience and being forced to become dependent on the goodness of others and forced to pay attention rather than to capture things. Last year, we were together with a couple who uh, were very um, intent. And um, um, anyways, that's a whole other story. Greg, you just came back on screen for me. Did you want to step in and move me on? I can't hear you. I, I thought you were at that point when you were talking when you when you transitioned away from from uh, Jesus. Francis, and, it's a really okay. beautiful. Uh, you know, but it's a really beautiful way of uh, uh, looking at both their legacies as, as pilgrims. Um, and then we also have uh, Smee to do the uh, the return, uh, and bringing back uh, the lessons from pilgrimage, bring coming down from the mountain and sharing those lessons with others. Um, it's kind of a challenge to think about the return when we really are still just on the journey. And I appreciate the wisdom of my companions here who have shared such beautiful pieces. But one of the pieces of our Franciscan tradition um, is the itinerant life, is to go on pilgrimage, but then to come back to the marketplace. We even read how Francis would go up um, to the mountains each night and reflect on what has happened and then every morning come back down to the marketplace um, to be among the people 
he knows not to always be a hermit. Um, and so that's our journey as well. Um, so at some point in time, each of us will conclude this pilgrimage um, in a formal way and bring back, bring home what our experience has been. I always tell my pilgrims um, that we've had such beautiful experiences of bread being broken, Eucharist that has never been like it is in my parish, wine that's shared as we did last night, that is so lush and wonderful as never before. Stories that are told that you just can't believe. All of it is real, it's genuine. As Conrad said, it's not coincidence, it's a providence. And the joy of a pilgrimage, different than a tour, is that it continues to unfold in the days and weeks and even year ahead, because God is already ahead of us. Know that as you move through this journey, you will be different. Mostly as Father spoke last night from the inside out. Oh yeah, maybe a few more pounds from all the pasta we ate. <laughs> and maybe a little less because of all the walking that we have done. You have heard God's voice. You have felt his warmth. You have seen your own goodness in ways that perhaps is miraculous. And this will make the difference. As it did for Jesus, so beautifully shared here, as it did for Francis, as it does for each one of us, every time we go on pilgrimage, there will be a return. The blessings are there. You will be different. And I wonder if, in fact, during this time, very significant of what we are about in the pandemics before us, whether it's the pandemic of social injustices, the pandemic of COVID and those who are in isolation or quarantine or whatever phase of that they are, or truly, as we all know, in the political differences that we experience. The call, I think, is always to compassion, to suffer with, Come facio, to suffer with. And as Father Conrad said, to, to be a greeter at Walmart, to take that attitude and to know whoever crosses our path is providential. Whatever path we're on is providential. The pilgrimage continues. Francis was called to repair, to repair the house of God. And can't we see that it is, it is falling to ruin around us? But he called and responded in such a way to build on the foundation, not to tear it down and start again, but to build on the relationships, to build on the truths, to build on the beauty that God has already planted in each of us and around us, no matter what political party we espouse no matter what side of COVID we're on. All lives matter. Black lives matter as the lost sheep today. Tomorrow it may be the Muslims, tomorrow it may be mine. But to build that up. And as we make our return, I've heard it said from each one who spoke this morning, it will be our challenge to look deeply into the eyes of the other and to see the face of Jesus. Be not afraid. The pilgrimage continues. We will continue to long, to listen to the calling, to make a decision intentionally to follow in the footprints of Jesus. And truly, we will be with good company. Abraham, Jesus, Francis, Conrad, as we are called to be and to serve the God who beckons us. The pilgrimage continues. Let us each commit to the decision to walk in the footprints of our beloved. 
Thank you so much, Smee. Here we are, we're not even midway through our virtual pilgrimage, and I'm having you talk about the return. And uh, <clears throat> you pointed that out at the beginning, and uh, it made me think of Mary Beth's uh, uh, talk yesterday on mindfulness and being present and, and the, the work that I need to do in order to stay present and in and, and the here and now and walk with pilgrimage. But uh, it's still good to look forward and think of the return and what are the lessons we're going to uh, take home uh, with us. Okay, I'm going to do a little uh, order of business here. I'm going to uh, uh, share, Dean, I'm going to share screen, and then I'm going to play the virtual pilgrimage of the Rieti Valley, followed by uh, uh, John Quigley's presentation on Jesus and PTSD. So bear with ju just a second. Hey, Greg, we don't have it showing on our end, I don't believe. We don't have it showing on our end. You're muted. You, because I thought you, uh, okay, that's my bad. <laughs> Dean, can you let me know if I uh, stay, uh, give me a heads up if this is. Uh... Is that okay, Dean? No, we don't have it on this end. It's not playing. Um, if you want, I have it ready on this end and I promise to hit the screen optimized so you guys get sound and audio if you want me to do it on this side. Uh, okay, hold on a second. Uh, let me um, stop share. Let me just do, give me one second here when I, I, I do have, oh, you know what, I didn't hit share. Is that working? Yep. Along with the Military Pilgrimage Program, present a virtual pilgrimage. Today, the Rieti Valley. source of all beauty from which where does it stem to my soul and that's why many authors and many therapists claim that when we come back from war our bodies come back before our souls we're trying to reconnect we're trying to reassert our antennae and search out for beauty bless the lord my soul and bless god Everybody has their stories, and when we talk about the quest for beauty, 
it takes on different forms in different situations. One of the stories that come to mind almost immediately in the Rieti Valley, because of the calm and the sense of human dignity, was when I was in Fallujah during the battle and the fighting had begun and all of a sudden a open bed truck wandered into the battle area and all over there was shouts, cease fire, cease fire. As I looked and peered, I saw there was an open bed truck filled with refugees, women, older, older people and children. And running down to that open bed truck, I looked at their faces and their eyes. And for some reason, the whole madness of war came into focus in the eyes of people who were looking for help, for aid, and for safety, almost immediately. Pallets of water were given them, and food as they were, how do you say, led off the field into a safe area. But it occurred to me that beauty is an opportunity to maintain human dignity. And that captured the whole moment in the contrast of a horrific experience. Bless the Lord, my soul. God answers all our needs. Peace and all good. Or as they say in Italy, pace bene. Or as they say in the Rieti Valley, where we'll visit today, buongiorno buona gente. A greeting Francis used every morning, in, enamored with this whole idea of being in a place of beauty. Well, we're about to go on this little tour, little pilgrimage, but we have to make sure we understand that pilgrimages are very different than going on just a hike or a vacation. That destination is most important for a, for a vacation, not for the pilgrim. The pilgrim is the journey. The pilgrim has to be open, has to be attentive, has to be responsive. I call that taking the oar, O-A-R. Also, the pilgrim has to be attentive to all beauty around him. Maybe it's not a post-traumatic disorder. Maybe it's an aesthetic aberration. We're trying to get our sense of beauty, spirituality back on focus. But as we go into the Rieti Valley in Italy, <clears throat> will become more, I think, enchanted with Francis of Assisi and why he went to this particular valley to regain that sense of aesthetics, also to regain the whole idea, this concept of beauty. And like the poet says, every time I go to nature, I come back healed. Well, let's take this journey. Let's go on pilgrimage. Let's see this valley which will open up a whole brand new transformation, hopefully for all of us. Let's begin. Alleluia, alleluia. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. Alleluia, alleluia. That was a typical, typical greeting Francis used when he came into the Rieti Valley, which is the object of our pilgrimage and prayer today. Keeping in mind the purpose of a pilgrim is to be a wanderer for the purpose. And for the veteran, a veteran's purpose is to regain his sense of aesthetics, his sense of beauty, her search for goodness and spirituality. And for Francis, it began in many places, over and over, but the Rieti Valley was special. I guess you could say for Francis, as the poets would say, for him it was all about mountains and music. And where could he find it better than this valley? But keep in mind, there are three valleys that Francis especially loved. First of all, the valley where he was born, the Spoleto Valley, in Assisi. He loved, he lived, he fought, he died there. The second is where you'll find out later 
is where he received the stigmata. It's called the Valley of Cincentino. It's up in Tuscany, another region of Italy, further north, where he received the stigmata and an intense mystical experience because of the trembling intensity he had with nature. But today, we're in the Rieti Valley. So let's go down south, bordering the region of Lazio and Umbria, and let's journey with Francis. Why did he go there? What did he find? What can we see for ourselves? First of all, Assisi had its merchants, it had its busyness, but there was a place where people could go still today, where they get away from all the hustle and bustle, much more quiet. And again, it was mountains and music for Francis. So he went down to these beautiful, beautiful hills and he discovered four areas. As a matter of fact, these four areas are in the shape of a cross and they're called sanctuaries. A sanctuary is where there was holy ground. Aha, very, very special for the pilgrim. The spirituality of a place, something holds significance for that particular area, like here in the United States, like Gettysburg, or many of the other battlefields, Ground Zero, or the USS Arizona. Spirituality of place where we have a sense of history and have also a sense of what it does to us and how we can change the world. When Francis came to the Rieti Valley, he found four of these areas. Let me talk about, not necessarily in order being founded, their significance. Hopefully, when we get the clear from COVID-19 and be able to turn physically to Italy, go back to the Rieti Valley as an experience with a veteran. Our experience is that the Rieti Valley held a special mystique for the veterans. They always wanted to go back there. And I think it was mountains and music, but there was something, something holy and wholesome. Let's start with the first sanctuary. It's called Poggio Bustone. This is a rather very reverent and solemn place. Francis was struggling with his experience of war. He wasn't sure God was forgiving him for what he did. What he did, we don't know. Could have been KIAs, WIAs, we're unsure. But we all have an, a sense of understanding that something happened as it well happened to us. So he goes to this place called Poggio Bustone, and there, after how long, we don't know, because of the beauty, the stillness, the quiet, and nature, Francis had a revelation that God had forgiven him. He comes back to this place more and more. As a matter of fact, there is a statue veterans seem to like very much, kind of abstract, but it's God hovering over Francis, who's on his knees, forgiving him. Who celebrated the Sacrament of Reconciliation there, open to all people. We've gone and climbed the hill, the little chapel of peace, where Francis would climb, and at that time, after many years, he would come back to Poggio Bustoni with the brothers. And there he would send them out, different corners of the world. If you want to remember anything of Poggio Bustoni, it's pardon and peace. As a matter of fact, he sent them on pilgrimages. And one of the great pilgrimages that Francis wanted to embark upon, we're not quite sure if he finished it, but we know that Brother Bernard and Brother Giles did, was the Camino de Santiago. We can talk about that later, but it was a pilgrimage honoring the Apostle St. James. So Francis names a little chapel in Poggio Bustone, San Giacomo, St. James Chapel. So for us and for pilgrims who come to the Rieti Valley, we go to Poggio Bustone reflecting on God's forgiveness, God filling us with a sense of peace, and the response, sending us out to the world, proclaiming that on pilgrimage. Remember, or openness, attentiveness, and response. The second sanctuary, as we're traveling, and by the way, it's been suggested by the veterans, that why don't we just do a pilgrimage 
of all four sanctuaries. It would be a kind of a challenge, but you know what? I think we might be up to it, especially for the experience. Because from Poggio Bastone, we could move to the second place called Fonte Colombo. Fonte, fountain, Colombo of doves. This place was another place where Francis came after the brothers had joined him. Many years after Poggio Bastone and his awareness of God's forgiveness, it was a place where he had so many brothers following him. He was electric. The world was following him and didn't know why, because he had a sense of peace and purpose. He comes to Fonte Colombo to kind of like write down, well, what kind of, what kind of guidelines should we have living as brothers, Franciscan brothers? And he had to think this over and over and over. But something else happened to him. He did in the course of his many years, and of course we're jumping all around history now, he does go to Egypt. He goes to Egypt to talk to the Sultan and he had a wonderful experience. But when he comes back, something happened physically to his eyes. Uh, they call it a trachoma of some sort. It was a very, very bad disease that probably modern medicine would have a remedy for. There wasn't except burning, a burning with a searing of the temples. Sounds chaotic, and it was. But he comes to Fonte Colombo, and there the surgeon is waiting for him. And he has the iron in the fire. And as Francis looked at this fire that was going to be seared onto his temple, a... I know, it was a medieval practice, he calls the, the fire brother. brother fire. Right, I'm, I'm in the middle of a meeting. Let me call you as soon as I'm done. Has it Are they going to be there for a little while? The okay, all right. The Let me call you back, Ben. No, I, I, and all were amazed. It was a sense of peacefulness. And of course, this is what the brothers saw in him that wanted to follow him. And that's why they call Fonte Colombo to this day the Mount Sinai of the Franciscan Order, where our guidelines were written and how the brothers became champions of peace and healing. Going down to the third sanctuary, a place of holy ground for Francis, was very, very small. It's called La Foresta, Santa Maria de la Foresta. It was called originally Saint Fabian, San Fabiano. A small church, old priest who was very, very poor, and Francis loved the solitude and needed to be alone. You know that feeling. We all have those feelings. The priest says, why don't you stay with us? And people won't bother you because he was getting people from all around looking for him. Well, it didn't work. He found La Foresta and he was besieged by people from all over the place. And guess what? The poor priest had to make his own altar one. He had a small vineyard and it was harvest time. So what would you do? Well, let's try this grape. Everyone said that. And what was happening, people almost ate all the grapes. The priest in the meantime said, uh, Brother Francis, scusi, I have a problem. And Francis says, tell me, brother. He says, I'm not gonna have grapes for altar wine. Francis says, how many barrels of wine do you get from these grapes? He says, at least 12. Francis said, I'm going to pray, and God will give you 20 barrels of wine. Harvest time came. The priest was very, very dejected. He knew he was going to get two or three. He got 20. And they call that story the miracle of the grapes. Francis' beauty, his holiness, his focus on beauty paid off even in nature, which today we are being encouraged to look at our brothers and sisters as he did. Moving from La Foresta, we go to the fourth sanctuary. And this is called Greccio. Ah, I can feel it. Here we are in Greccio. An awesome sanctuary, kind of hard to get to. If you want to do the pilgrimage walk, it would be a challenge. We can get there because the sanctuary is built on this rock out of the mountain. As a matter of fact, when we were there with veterans a year ago, 
we marveled how they ever got the construction up there, a, a feat of, of, of construction. But great show. Francis goes there as well for solitary, solitary prayer, solitary um, contemplation of beauty. But there he was enamored with some principles in his life. As we point out to the veterans, there were three areas that fascinated him about this Christianity and about Christ. It was the crib, the incarnation, the word became flesh. It was the cross, the humility, laying down of one's life and bearing the wounds. And it was the Eucharist, receiving this body and blood of this Christ who became human. But you know, in the 13th century, people were not obsessed with this whole idea of Christ being born. Oh, they, they had mass uh, on, on Christmas and there was all types of maybe Christmas celebrations. But Francis, wait, you're missing the whole point. Why don't we reenact how it happened? And he asked the people of Great Shield, that fourth sanctuary in the Rieti Valley, remember, mountains and music. And he asked a little boy, I want you to throw this stone and wherever you, you throw it, wherever it lands, we are going to build a reenactment of Bethlehem. This little boy had a great arm. He went about two kilometers away. That's a great arm. But his friend, John Valita, a knight who, was, who would do anything for Francis, said, Francis, if you pick that spot, we'll build. I'll get animals, we'll reenact. Are you sure this is going to work? Francis says, it will. When do you want this done? Well, how about in two weeks? How about it? in two weeks was Christmas Eve? And so the townspeople came with torches. People brought their animals. And they even built a small crib. And they were singing the gospel of Christmas night and something wonderful happened. And it's eyewitness account that someone said during the gospel, a child appeared in Francis's arm and he laid it on this hewn rock made into a manger. And you had the first Christmas crash of Christianity. That idea caught on, as you know, in our homes today and many, many churches, all different denominations, not just Catholic, build these crashes and they attribute it also to what happened in the Rieti Valley at the little town of Great Shield. It is said about Fonte Colombo being the Mount Sinai for the Franciscan order. Great Shield is the Bethlehem. Again, the crib, the cross, and the, and the Eucharist were the, the ideals that fascinated Francis. So Francis had the sanctuary, crossed the sanctuary in, in the Rieti Valley. Did he come back? Many times. Do pilgrims come there? They do but not as many as come to Assisi and other places. That's why the Rieti Valley has many people who come there for retreat, spend time in solitude, or just hike nature, mountains and music, recapturing the soul, understanding the beauty of our existence, putting together our lives and realizing, as Francis did in Poggio Bustone, that God forgives us, God's always with us, and that is the beauty of the Franciscan pilgrimage for veterans. Thank you for joining us as we move into our next opportunity. Hopefully, you'll be able to visit physically these holy places, to be able to be standing there with your feet on the ground. We experience what God has given us through this warrior, Francis of Assisi. And one last thought. In Poggio Bustone, that little town, on St. Francis morning, which we celebrate every year on October 4th, a little boy, not the one from Great Shield, a little boy walks throughout the whole city. He knocks on everybody's door and he says, Buongiorno, buona gente. Welcome to the celebration of St. Francis. He has come into our valley and made us love God in his mountains and music. Pace bene. Thank you.
St. Francis is a, uh, uh, a wonderful person in Western civilization history. Uh, and he's accessible to all different groups of people, Buddhist, Muslim, uh, Roman Catholic, Lutheran, etc., Jewish brothers and sisters. Uh, because he is seen as a man who was very uh, gentle, very committed, very, uh, uh, very, we'd say very spiritual. Um, but I think it's important to go back and to, to see what were some of the dynamic in his life. What, why did he become Francis of Assisi, a saint? Um, Francis was born in a small little community called Assisi, uh, about 90 miles north of Rome. And he was brought into a family that was part of the nouveau riche, the, the new wealthy class of people coming together and they would train their sons for uh, gallant, uh, heroic uh, chivalry and dressing an army and going into battle and coming back and uh, winning the hearts of the beautiful women in town. So Francis, in many ways, as a young boy and a young teenager, was spoiled. His, his dad had a very successful uh, cloth business selling very elaborate and beautiful materials, fabric. And they also owned land around the town of Assisi. So Francis came from sustenance, from uh, a good foundation financially. And then one day in 1202, he went off with the other people from uh, Assisi to a big battle. And there was over between uh, Perugia and Assisi, about maybe 20 miles, 30 miles apart. And um, they were surprised by the strength of the Perugians. They were surrounded and they were completely decimated. They were just wiped out. Francis was taken a prisoner in that battle and taken back to the other town of Perugia where he was put into a prison, we know, for about a year. In our history as Franciscans, we never look much at this history of the, of the imprisonment of Francis. We think of his conversion when he was a, a knight in shining armor and happy and dancing and singing and as a minstrel. And then he came and he had a conversion when he was in the small little church of San Damiano, just outside of Assisi. And it was in that little chapel that the crucifix spoke to him and told him, asked him, Francis, you see my church around you is in ruins, would you help rebuild it? We've often thought that was the moment of conversion for Francis. But I'm thinking more and more seriously now that the real conversion period in Francis's life that marked his beginning and the second half of his life was the time that he was in this prison as a, as a military prisoner of war. Now, we don't know what the prison was like exactly. Uh, we think of it as like a, a cell with bars and a big lock and a, a, gu a guard with uh, keys. But the prisons like that were not invented in Western Europe for another 80 years after Francis. And so what we have come to understand is that he probably was held in a temporary holding place. Uh, they wouldn't, they had a number of prisoners and they wouldn't put them all in a little tiny basement of a house. The speculation is, is that there's on the outskirts, just on the other edge of the town piazza, the main center square, there was on the side of the, of the, of the hill or the mountain, there was a large quarry where they would take the rock from the quarry and they would rebuild the houses and the buildings of the city of Perugia. 
And this quarry would have served as a very convenient place to be a holding place for prisoners. So speculation is that Francis was thrown into this pit with other men caught in, as prisoners of war. And he lived in this open air hole for a good year. And it was during that time, I'm convinced, he had a complete disillusionment with, with his former life, with his father, with his, the, his economic standards of his community that put him into the war. Uh, he had to depend on nature. He had to depend on the kindness of strangers to feed him. And during that whole time, he was waiting and waiting and waiting for liberation. Now, the, his father and uncles and relatives were negotiating with the town of Perugia uh, to have a, a, these men could be released. But it took a year. And you take an 18, 19 year old young man who's on top of his strength and, his, and is full of ego, and you put him into that situation for a year. <coughs> Excuse me, but open to, the, open to the air, open to the rain, the snow, the wind. The, the frightening parts of night when you're not sure if other animals or rats are going to be running around in that hole with you. What we know is that after Francis was liberated in 1203, sent back home, he was profoundly changed. He, he could not adjust. He, he was okay, and then he would fall apart. He, he, the man who was the minstrel and would be in the town square with all his classmates and singing and dancing and telling stories, now he is spending a lot of time alone. He was going up hiding in a way in the caves around the city. There was a companion who would meet with him and he would talk. And then he would come back in and he would try to be back in his dad's business and it would last for a little while and then he would, he would fall apart again. So he was back and forth. Two different poles back and forth. Then there was the moment that he was in this little chapel in refuge and the crucifix spoke to him. And that's what we look as his moment of real conversion when he became no longer Francis the warrior but Francis the saint of Assisi. But if, and when Francis was preparing to die he wrote a last will and a testament to the friars that they should keep as their memory of his last words to them. And in that record, it's just about, you can read it in about 10, 15 minutes, very brief. He talks about his life when he had his most profound conversion. And the conversion was not in that little chapel. He, doesn't, he never refers to that chapel and the crucifix that spoke to him. But he speaks of when he was living with the lepers and doing mercy with them. Now we have retold that story and saying that Francis when one day was walking down uh, or on a horse perhaps coming down the road and all of a sudden he was surprised because there was a leper, a man standing there and the lepers were very frightening people to Francis and the people who had good health. But Francis had on an impulse went up to the man and embraced him, kissed him, and then he turned around. And when he turned back, the man had disappeared because he was Jesus Christ. And this was the moment of great conversion for Francis. Francis never talks of kissing a leper. Francis talks of living with the lepers and doing mercy with them. This is a very profound experience for Francis that people who have been traumatized by war, by imprisonment, by violence, losing their home, their, their country, when people go through a profound sense of violence and destruction and loss, we now refer to that as post-traumatic stress. I'm convinced that Francis of Assisi was a victim of profound post-traumatic stress that he suffered the rest of his life the next 25 years after he got out of the prison in Perugia. And it's because of the way he interacted with this suffering, with this inner turmoil, that he became 
and grew into the full Francis of Assisi that we have grown to love and care for. One of the passages that I think is, is very instructive, illustrative on this, is uh, something in the book called The Evil Hours. It's by David Morris, and it's a biography of post-traumatic stress disorders. He was in Afghanistan, and may have even been in Iraq and then Afghanistan. And he came back to California, severely traumatized by his experience, losing friends. And uh, he tried all kinds of methods. He went into different types of uh, uh, rehab work, he went into counseling, individual counseling, etc., etc., and in effect, nothing worked. He was frustrated. And the terror and the, the terror of the night continued to disturb him, etc. He said that after a while, one of the therapists said maybe he should try this other particular uh, type of therapy. The dozen of us in the room were a study in what Judith Herman in her classic Trauma and Recovery called the dialectic of trauma. Some of us were up, some were down, and some were just elsewhere. Whenever the facilitators said something about IEDs or snipers, a half dozen legs would start jumping up and down like sewing machine needles. There were the usual instructions and introductions. Now there was Fernando, the recently retired Marine who had done seven deployments in the Middle East since September 11. And there was Greg, the young father who played with his aluminum cane after limping to his seat. Tim, the Iraq veteran, now at San Diego State. Kyle, seated in a plaid thrift store chair to my left, his eyes patrolling the room from underneath a camouflage baseball cap. And I recognized Josh, one of the veterans from my in-processing exam months before. And he struck me as being almost an invalid. He was nearly completely immobile in the waiting room as his wife sat next to him, patiently guiding him through a thick, thick stack of intake forms going line by line. And to my right was a sign that read, please refrain from telling war stories. Your story could trigger for someone else. Yes, at first glance, this was what should have been a depressing scene. And yet I was secretly elated. This was a room of suffering, a room filled with enough anxiety to power a small city, filled with guys who had paid a lot for daring to sign up, and probably a lot more than I ever expected to pay. But to me, it was a room filled with a strange kind of almost poetic beauty. Something we are so rarely allowed to see in this world. Trauma and loss and the work of history written on human faces. This man went through all kinds of therapy, uh, counseling, medical treatment, and yet where he was profoundly touched and healed is that when he was with other veterans in various stages of profound suffering. It reminded me so much of Francis that he says that when he first went to the lepers, he was repulsed by it by them. But then when he did mercy with them, when he entered into their circle and lived with them, he said what before had been frightening and even disgusting suddenly became sweetness and delight. And then Francis says it was then 
It was after that that then I left the world and began on his journey. So what is so fascinating is that Francis of Assisi marks the beginning of his spiritual life when he is with those who are similar to him. Those who were lepers, those who were outcasts. He was, by then he was ridiculed by family, by neighbors, by uh, classmates. They thought he was off his rocker, that he, 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 he dressed differently, he dressed in rags. He didn't comb his, wash his hair, he, he was disheveled. He spent time up in the mountains, hiding in the caves, coming into the city, kind of scaring people, but then trying to readjust and not getting back into it very well. But when he was down in the lower valley, outside of Assisi, and lived in the commune with the lepers, he had a very profound experience of finally being at home. And the healing began in a very profound way. I'd like to thank uh, Father uh, John Quigley for that reflection. Uh, John, one of the things you said in there was it was his relationship with his suffering that made St. Francis of Assisi, who the saint and who we, the legacy we know of uh, St. Francis uh, today. It reminded me of what uh, Father George Torak was talking about yesterday, that relationship with suffering and how it comes uh, to define us, but also the opportunity that's there uh, in terms of the putting it putting it on the spiritual plane, and then uh, w what can follow. Uh, Saint Francis really captures a beautiful spirit in that regard. Conrad, thank you for that uh, reflection on uh, the Rieti Valley as well. Uh, for um, um, for so. Uh, this was what we had planned for the morning. It went a lot longer than what we uh, originally uh, had scheduled out. I apologize for that. Um, but I did think, you know, I did think it was something that uh, would be good if we all experienced together. Uh, you can still see those if you want to watch them on your own. The, the links are on the schedule. And then uh, uh, there is a, a walk to do today. And also, please uh, send pictures in. Uh, of uh, of that, or uh, the, the assignment is either pictures or a poem, or not a poem, but a, a hundred words or less writing assignment, but it could be a poem if uh, you choose to do so. Um, uh, I would ask when you send that in, send that directly to me. I, some of you are attaching them to uh, things that I sent to you in the past, and it it's tough for me to find those pictures. So if you could just send new uh, links, I get, you have my uh, email address and it'd be a lot easier for me then to download them and then to show everybody in the evening session. Uh, uh, Father Conrad, would you uh, like to take us out with, the, uh, with that prayer that was so important to St. Francis? We adore you, Lord Jesus Christ in all your churches in the whole world and we bless you because by your holy cross you have redeemed the Thanks, Conrad. Thanks, I'm just looking at the uh, chats. Uh, Mary Frances Charsky uh, asked, please send the assignment to us all, Mary, uh, uh, Mary Frances. Those are in the schedule that uh, I sent out, uh, the welcome packet. So if you just refer to the schedule, the assignment is in there. Conrad, thank you. Uh, love you all. We'll see you uh, this evening. Uh, that, 